Okay, so my apologies. Audio was not going through, and that's because the microphone, uh, microphone's working, but in the program that I have for streaming, it was selecting the wrong microphone. My apologies for that. Thank you very much, Lisa, for mentioning that you could not hear me. Hopefully you can hear me now. Give me a confirmation in the live chat if you can hear me. Just type a, maybe type a yes, I can hear you now. Hopefully, my apologies for the mistake. Let me backtrack a little bit over here. You didn't miss too much. I was just talking about my name's Paul and uh, subscribe. And here are the three areas we want to work on. I think everybody can hear me now. I see the audio levels going up and down. So I'm pretty sure audio is coming through. We talked about this iris method, which is really just inspecting something before you read it. That means get the gist of it. So you're looking at headings and subheadings. You're reading the introduction, the conclusion. Thank you, Lisa. I see your message. Thank you so much for pointing that out. My apologies. I feel like a noob. I've been doing webinars and stuff for a while, but I haven't done much live streaming on YouTube. And this is a new program that I'm using here. So sorry about that. So when we talk about inspecting, let me give you the broad idea of what this is. This is all about getting familiar with something before you read it. So if I'm reading a chapter in a textbook, I mean, this is not a textbook here, but uh, even if it's not a textbook, I'd be reading basically my entire introduction, flipping through, looking at headings and subheadings. If this was a textbook, I'd also be looking at boldface words, things are in it, that are in italics. And then uh, when I get to the end, I'm gonna read my conclusion. Now I'm ready to read. Once I start reading here, that's where my comprehension is going to be elevated because I already inspected the material first. So when I start reading it, I'll have better comprehension. But what about your reading speed? You'll probably read a little faster than you otherwise would have, right? And that's only because you got familiar with the material first. So very important to inspect before you read. Now, once you're done reading, you inquire. That means ask questions about what you just read. Inquiring means, it could mean asking questions like, what are the biggest takeaways? Or it could be asking more specific questions like, what do I need to memorize? That leads us to the storage step. So how do we store information? How do we remember? Well, first we know repetition helps you to remember things. I'll repeat that. Repetition helps you to remember. I've got some musical imagery here because we all know that music is easy to remember. There are songs I could put on right now you haven't heard in years, right? But you remember the lyrics to the song. That's actually kind of cool that you could remember the lyrics to a song that you haven't heard in years. And that's all about repetition, right? That's how you remember things. And also in music, you have other things repeating, right? You got the beats or the melody that repeats. You got the chorus that repeats. And of course, if the song is very popular, you hear it over and over again. Actually, there are songs you don't even like that you have memorized. I'm thinking Baby Shark right now. I'm thinking Baby Shark because I have a seven-year-old and when she was like three years old, she was obsessed with the song and she would listen to it over and over again. And of course you memorize it as a result. Also, they're just kind of saying the same thing over and over again, but that's the power of repetition. You could memorize something even if you don't like it, but it's not the only way you could remember things. Now, when it comes to reading and remembering, we need to get repetitions in. But here's the thing. I don't want to read this chapter over and over again just for the sake of repetition. I want to read it once and read it well. So how do we get our repetitions in? Through this process. We just talked about it, this IRIS method, an acronym for inspecting and then reading and then inquiring and then figuring out how we're going to store. Let's focus on this right now since today is a session focused on memorization techniques. So there are some other things that you need to know that are going on in your brain when we're trying to remember things and that we can leverage to improve our memory. One of these things is called visualization. So visualization is just your brain's ability to visualize something that isn't even there. So if I asked you to visualize a coffee cup, you can picture it in your mind. Or if I asked you to visualize, I don't know, a family member, it could be your mom, dad, brother, sister, whoever, you can visualize them without them actually physically being there. That's what they call visualization, or psychologists also refer to this as your mind's eye. That's why I have this creepy image of a brain with an eyeball on it. So we're gonna utilize and leverage visualization, but 
the idea behind visualization, it's uh, the reason why you forget someone's name, but you remember their face. By the way, you may have forgotten my name. And that's okay. My name's Paul, by the way. And if you forgot my name, I'm not going to take it personally because everybody forgets names. It's very, very common. And that's because names are, if you think about it, are abstract. It's verbal information. Uh, but a face, that's visual information. And uh, visual recall is much better than verbal recall. That's just the nature of how your brain works. We remember things that are visual more so than verbal. But the problem is we have a lot of verbal information we need to remember, right? We have all this information we're reading and we're trying to digest and understand and remember. So we need a way to convert verbal to visual. We're going to work on that. Now, think about your short-term memory and your long-term memory. How many items would it take uh, before you make a list? Let me know in the comments or in the live chat, how many items would it take? Because you wouldn't make a list if you're just going to get bread and milk. How many items would it take before you hit a wall and you're like, you know what, I better write this down. Or, I mean, for me, I just take a digital note in my phone when I'm going to the store. At what point would you do that? Because if it's just two or three items, you probably wouldn't. For me, it's like, I don't know, four or five items. For some others, it might be like five or six. Now, this is actually an interesting question that has some research behind it. And you ever wonder why phone numbers are seven digits in length? It has to do with something called Miller's Magic Number. It's all about short-term memory, that it takes about five, six, seven things before your memory kind of falls off a cliff. Or as I see, Lisa says six. A lot of people would be like, five or six, four or five. Very few people would be like, ah, oh, it takes me about uh, 13 items before I make a list. No, that's very rare. Unless you get the same 13 items every single week, then of course you'll remember that because repetition. But Miller's magic number, it's named after this guy, George Miller. So back in the 40s, he was doing some research on the topic of short-term memory. And he wrote a paper in uh, 1952. Uh, the paper was called the magic number seven plus or minus two and it had a lot to do with short-term memory that basically we could remember about four or five six items basically this is the point graphically speaking where our memory kind of falls off a cliff so take a look at this uh 10 digit number right now if you look at it long enough you can try to memorize it but you know it's 10 digits i it's a lot of information at once. Now, if you have it memorized, great. I'd be surprised if you got it. Most people wouldn't, but if you got it, great. But we could memorize it if we got a lot of repetition. And like if we stared at it for a while, or if we wrote it down a bunch of times, or if we just repeat it over and over again, of course you'll remember. But what if we took a different number? Which number's easier to memorize? From these three numbers, I think all of us would agree. Uh, the bottom number is the easiest. But uh, if you look long enough, you'll see all these numbers are the same. It's just the format looks different. So in the first format, we at the top, we have 3,126,794,053. The next one is, uh, you know, 31, 26, 79, 40, 53. The next one is 312, 679, 4053. Now, all of us would agree the bottom number is easiest to memorize, but notice how your brain will look at these three numbers and interpret them differently as far as, oh, this one's easy, this one's hard, even though they're all the same digits. The formatting is important, and that's because of a few things going on in your brain when it comes to this number at the bottom. One is something called chunking, and uh, that's how we learned to spell Wednesday, right? You took the word Wednesday and you broke it down to Wednesday. Our brain remembers and processes information better when we break it down in, into parts and chunk the information. Now, that number at the bottom is also more memorable because it looks like a phone number. That's called association. So association is really how we learn. We associate one thing with another, and that's how we remember the information well. And actually, you could associate this not just as a phone number, but as a certain type of phone number in the area code, right? If you know 312 is equal to uh, the area code of Chicago, that's my hometown, by the way, where I was born and raised. 
I'm actually broadcasting from the Miami area. I moved here about a year and a half ago. But you can make these associations based on the area code, the fact that it looks like a phone number, and that makes it easier to remember. So association is an interesting memory concept because it reminds me of something called the Baker-Baker effect. Sometimes they call this the Baker-Baker paradox. But here's the gist of what this is. This is a study that they've done in psychology, and they've done it many times, and it always has the same result. What they do is they take two groups of people, and they're all introduced to the same guy. And in group number one, they want to see how many people are going to remember his name. Now, they don't tell everybody that's the point of the study. Otherwise, it would kind of skew the results because everybody would try harder than usual to remember his name. They tell them the study's about something else. Halfway through, they get introduced to this guy. His name's Mr. Baker. So they get introduced to Mr. Baker. And later on, they're brought back and asked individually, what do you remember about this guy? Do you remember his name? And guess what? Most people forget. Not surprising, right? Actually, a lot, it's very common for people to forget names. It's usually like 90% of the people or more that will forget his name. Now, that's not interesting. What's interesting is group number two. They're told that he is a baker, not Mr. Baker, but that his occupation is a baker. Now, guess what happens here? When they bring this group back and they ask, what do you remember about that person you were introduced to? Almost everybody remembers that he was a baker. And this is what's known as the Baker-Baker effect. And it's all about memory and association, that in one case, if it's Mr. Baker, uh, if you don't make any associations to the name, it's hard to remember. But the occupation of a baker, you already have associations in your brain related to a baker. What do you think of when you think of a baker? I mean, there's a lot of things you can think of, right? A certain kind of a look, right? Like a top hat, an apron. You might think of uh, cakes, cookies bread. So the fact that there's associations already in your brain make it more likely that you'll remember this. And that's what's known as the Baker-Baker effect. It really illustrates the importance of association. Now, there's one other thing that has a deep impact on your ability to remember things, and that is the fact that you remember things that are weird. Anything that is strange or ridiculous or exaggerated is much more memorable. So this is why McDonald's at some point decided, let's use a clown to help sell more cheeseburgers. And it doesn't make any sense, but it's also kind of creepy. I think uh, once the, you know, the horror film It, based on the book, when that came out, I think they started using the clown a little less. Uh, but I could give you names of other companies and you would think of imagery as well. Like if I said Geico, what do you think of when I say Geico? You probably think of a, a talking gecko, this lizard, right? It's got like a, an Australian, is it Australian or British? I don't know my accents that well, but that is purposely done, right? It's purposely done because we remember things that are unique, things that are different or exaggerated. So we gotta keep this in mind because we're gonna use this to our benefit when we try to memorize things. So let's get into it. We're gonna store some information and we're gonna do a little exercise here where I get you to memorize all of this. Okay, you're going to remember that one is exercise, two is survival, three is wiring. These are the chapters in this book, Brain Rules. Now, the subtitle here, you see it says 12 Principles for Surviving and Thriving at Work, Home, and School. These are those 12 principles or what they call the 12 Brain Rules. Let's just assume for a moment that uh, you read this book, you understood it well, but now you got to memorize something. Maybe you got to memorize all 12 of these in a precise order. We're going to use a technique to help you remember it, and it's called the numeric peg system. So the numeric peg system is a great way to visually remember things in a precise order. So we're going to use this, this uh, example on this brain rules example. To memorize all this, we're going to use this numeric peg system. Here's how it works. Basically, you're going to take numbers and you're going to associate them to visuals, okay? And the way that we're going to do that is very, very simple. You're going to go one by one, and the number one is going to be visualized as a pencil, okay? So I need you to commit that to memory right now. 
that number one is a pencil. All right. One is a pencil. Why? Because they have the same shape. That's all. The number two. Number two is going to be visualized as a swan. Okay. Think of the two as a swan. Picture that for a moment. They have the same resemblance as far as shape goes. Two is a swan. Number three is going to be McDonald's. Okay. Three is McDonald's. Got it? Okay. Let's move on to number four. Four is a chair. Uh, you see the number four, it's upside down, the chair, but you see the number four here. Here's the, uh, by the way, the chair, here's the seat, there's the backrest. So if you turn the chair upside down, it kind of looks like a number four. Okay, four is a chair. I'm going to quiz you on this in a few moments here. We'll see if we get them. Five is a hook. Number five is a hook. Uh, now, you see the curvy part of the five here? There's the curvy part of the five right here. So if you have to visualize it from the top going down, five is a hook. All right, let's see if you could remember numbers one through five. And this is just a self quiz. Uh, think to yourself, what is number one? You probably remember, pencil. What about number two? Hopefully you remember it. Number two is a swan. How about number three? Three, of course, is McDonald's. Okay, how about number four? Four is the chair. And number five, do you remember number five? Easy, five is a hook. Okay, very good. And uh, thank you all for, for those of you, if you're participating in the chat or the comments, you could always, you know, just for your own reference, write these down or type them out. Let's move on. You just gotta remember 10 visuals to make this work really well. Number six is gonna be a cherry. I know it's not a perfect visual, but, it's a visual approximation. You see the cherry over here with the stem coming out over there? Looks like a cherry. So six, I promise you this is going to come in handy. Seven is a lightning bolt. Seven is lightning. So you see the number seven right here? You see another seven right here? So when you have a lightning bolt, we have seven. So associate seven with lightning. Eight is a racetrack. Even though it'd be kind of weird if they had racetracks with intersections like this, just... Uh, I don't know, maybe there's a overpass, but eight is gonna be our racetrack. Nine is gonna be a balloon. You see the balloon, right? With the little string coming out. Nine is balloon. And 10 is a play setting. 10 is a plate or a bowl, you know, a play setting with a, it could be a spoon on the side or a fork or chopsticks, whatever you want. But you see a one here, a one and a zero, right? That's 10, it's a play setting. All right, quick review before we start applying this. You think about the number six. What is number six? Hopefully you remember, oh yeah, six is a cherry. How about number seven? Oh yeah, number seven, that's my uh, that's my lightning bolt, right? Okay, good. Number eight, you're thinking racetrack. Very good. And number nine, balloon. By the way, I'm pausing here just to give you a moment to think about it. And number 10, that's the play setting, right? The play it or the bowl. Okay, we got them all. Success, maybe. Hey, look, we're both wearing green. Look at that. That is not me, by the way. This is an internet meme for a few years. This kid's, uh, I don't know how old this kid is now, but he's been an internet meme for a few years. <laughs> he's got some uh, sand on his lip, it looks like, over here. Anyway, let's move on to applying and associating with what we got to memorize. What do we have to memorize? In this example, it's the brain rules. We're assuming that maybe we read this, we got to memorize this list of brain rules. We're going to use this technique to do it. So chapter one's about exercise and all these other ones, right? Survival, wiring, attention, short-term memory, long-term memory, sleep, stress, sensory integration, and vision, okay? Now, one way we could memorize it if we really wanted to is just repeat. We'll be like exercise, survival, wiring, attention, short-term memory, long-term memory, sleep, stress, sensory integration, vision. Oh, there's actually 12. Music, exploration, <sighs> exercise, survival, wiring, attention, short-term memory, long-term memory, sleep, stress, sensory integration, vision, music, exploration. <sighs> do it again and again and again. And this is a very boring way to study, but I mean, some people will do extreme amounts of repetition and it could work, but there's a better way. All right. This technique will help us, you'll see, 
it's an easier way because what we're going to do is we're going to visually associate exercise with a pencil. Now, how are we going to do this? Remember what I said earlier. You want you, you remember things that are weird, right? So anything exaggerated is more memorable. So I want you to, I'll give you the visuals that I want you to picture in your mind. And this only works if you take a moment to visualize in your head, what would that look like? So for exercise, I want you to imagine that there's a brand new gym that opens up in your neighborhood. And in this gym, everybody is working out with pencils. And uh, a little confusing because maybe you're regretting signing up for this gym, but there's somebody uh, doing bench press with a pencil, someone else doing curls with a pencil, or the shoulder press with a pencil. So imagine this strange gym where everybody's working out with pencils, okay? Number two is survival. That's what we got to remember. Number two, we said that's going to be visually represented as a swan, the number two, because they have the same shape. So I want you to imagine a swan that is struggling for survival in that it's drowning. Okay, it's drowning. It does not know how to swim. It doesn't make sense because swans should have a default setting of knowing how to swim, but just go with it. Okay, so the swans don't, the swan doesn't know how to swim. Maybe you feel bad for this poor swan. You see it flapping its wings, it's drowning. You jump into the lake to try and save it. So imagine that for number two a swan struggling for survival. Now, by the way, I'm, I realize I'm giving you my visuals. That's only because we're doing a live stream here. If we were like in a class in person, all of us could come up with different visuals individually and that would work fine. You just got to make sure that you visualize and that you exaggerate to some extent. Because again, you remember things, you're more likely to remember something if it's weird or exaggerated. So wiring is number three. The number three is McDonald's. So we got to associate these two. I want you to imagine you go to McDonald's uh, even if you don't like McDonald's, just pretend. And you go there and let's say you get a Big Mac. Uh, you bite into the Big Mac and there's a piece of barbed wire in your Big Mac. How? Imagine how painful that would be to bite into a Big Mac with barbed wire. Imagine how, imagine how angry you would be or how disgusting that would be. And I want you to imagine pain, disgust, and anger because it turns out your emotions also play a part and how you remember things. You're more likely to remember something if you also get your emotions involved. So that's why I'm asking you to imagine how disgusting, how angry you would be, how painful that would be. So just go with it. You picture these things. You don't have to picture negative emotions. You could also imagine positive emotions like uh, something that's really, really funny or something that makes you really happy or something really silly. All of this can help. We move on to number four. I got to remember attention. I got to associate attention with the chair, right? Number four is a chair. So I'm going to imagine a chair that helps you pay attention. You see this chair here? You see those creepy hands? Every time you're uh, watching a webinar or you're in class and you're not paying attention, these hands will just kind of like tap you on the shoulder like, hey, pay attention, okay? So imagine this creepy chair that helps you to pay attention. That's gonna be number four. Number five is a hook. We gotta remember short-term memory. So I want you to imagine, because if you look ahead, you'll see that number six is long-term memory. So we just got to distinguish between short and long. So imagine, I don't know about you, but when I think of hooks, when I think of a hook, I think of pirates. So let's go the pirate route. And for short-term memory, let's picture some really short pirates, like some short baby pirates. And there's like 20 of them on a beach. They all have like shovels. They're looking for their buried treasure. They're digging for it. They buried it last night. Unfortunately, they can't remember where they buried it because they have short-term memory problems. Okay. Notice how I'm really doubling up on the whole short idea. And that's because I want to remember short-term memory. Short pirates with short-term memory problems. And uh, that's how I'm going to remember number five. Now, if you had to backtrack, and let's say you had to remember this right now, the way you're going to remember it is through the numbers. Those are your clues. Number one, the clue is pencil, right? That's easy to remember because the one has the same shape as a pencil. What does that remind you of? Probably reminds you of exercise, right? People working out with pencils. How about number two? When you think about number two, what does that remind you of? What is the chapter title? Number two is the swan. 
So the swan is basically our clue to remember, oh yeah, a swan that was drowning, struggling for survival, two is survival. Three, McDonald's, right? The image for three is McDonald's. Oh, that'll help us backtrack and say, okay, there was a Big Mac, it had barbed wire in it. Oh yeah, chapter three was about wiring. Number four, hmm, oh yeah, four is my chair. Does that remind you of something? Remember that creepy chair with the hands? To help us pay attention, chapter four is about attention. And five, of course, is the hook. Hooks remind us of pirates. They're really short pirates, short-term memory. So I think you get the idea. Let's move on. Let's run through the rest of these because I think you get how this system works. But let's try to memorize the, all 12. Long-term memory is number six. And number six is a cherry. Picture a cherry with a ridiculously long stem. You see this image here? Imagine you're, uh, you know, you find some cherries and you find one of them has like a three or four foot stem. I got to remember long-term memory. So the cherry with the long stem. Seven is sleep. I'm associating seven with a lightning bolt. So lightning, I have to associate to sleep. Imagine uh, you get an alarm clock that has a special feature. You know the, uh, the snooze button on your alarm clock? When you hit snooze, you get zapped by lightning. You get struck by lightning if you hit snooze. That's to provide a, uh, you know, a disincentive to hitting snooze too often. Okay, and that's of course related to sleep. Number eight. The topic is stress. Eight is a racetrack. Remember, I said they'd never make racetracks with intersections like this. Imagine they did. And every time the race car drivers get close to that intersection, they might crash, right? And that, of course, is very stressful. So imagine a racetrack with a stressful intersection, okay? But you really got to picture this. I have a picture of the race car driver. They'd be sweating. Maybe they're yelling from stress. That's how we're going to remember number eight. Number nine, sensory integration. Number nine is a balloon. So what are we going to do here? Let's take sensory integration, and uh, I want you to, you might think this is a little bit of a vague term, right? Sensory integration. But this is all about your five senses, and your five senses all have body parts associated with them, right? Your sense of touch, a hand, a nose for your sense of smell, your ability to hear, taste, see. Picture those five body parts inside of a very, very large balloon, okay? Something like this, but I would picture an actual balloon, not this uh, caricature of a balloon. What would a real balloon filled with eyeballs and ears and hands and a nose and tongues, what would that look like? The more creepy you make it, the better. So our five senses related to sensory integration inside of a balloon. Why? Because nine is our balloon, sensory integration. Okay, number 10. 10 is vision, and of course, 10 is a play setting, right? A bowl or a plate, whatever you want. I think you know where we're going here, right? If we gotta remember vision, what are we gonna do with this plate or bowl? Uh, I think you're on the right track here. We should fill it with eyeballs. So picture a bowl or a plate filled with eyeballs, not these eye cartoony eyeballs. Picture, like, what would a plate full of eyeballs really, really look like? I think they'd be kind of moist, a little bloody. Uh, optic nerve still attached, you know, a little stringy optic nerve. Imagine one of these uh, eyeballs winks at you, like you're put off by that. So again, the more weird you make it, the better. Now, that's how we're going to remember vision. 10 is vision because we have a, a bunch of eyeballs in a bowl or a plate. Same process is what we follow. Number six is a cherry. Oh yeah, the cherry with the long stem, long-term memory. Seven is lightning. Oh yeah, the lightning bolt, getting struck by lightning when I hit snooze. Uh, that's related to sleep, right? How about number eight? Do you remember that one? The racetrack? Oh yeah, that stressful intersection. How about number nine? Eight is stress, right? Nine is balloon, right? The number nine is a balloon. What was the balloon filled with? The five body parts? Sensory integration. And number 10, is of course our play setting. It's a plate or a bowl. And hopefully that reminds you of the bowl or plate filled with eyeballs that's related to vision. 10 is vision. Now, if you got them all great, we still have 11 and 12. So what you got to do is, because 11 and 12 are music and exploration, 
You got to create, if you want to expand the system, you got to create a rule, or you can think of it as a theme that applies to all the numbers 11 through 20. And that rule could be whatever you want. The rule I use is snow. You don't have to use snow. You could use rain. It doesn't have to be weather related. This is totally arbitrary. Your rule can be anything you want. So it could be snow, it could be rain, it could be a book related theme like books. It could be uh, babies, it could be celebrities, it could be cars, the list goes on. So you choose a theme or a rule and here's how it works. This rule is going to apply to all the numbers 11 through 20. So I'm gonna use snow. In this example, just go with it. Uh, we could use snowflakes, a blizzard, uh, a snowman, a snowball fight. But here's how it works. When you get to 11, you got to take a pencil as part of your imagery. Why? Because 11 has a pencil in it, number one here. You got to take snow as well. Why? Because uh, we just decided that will be our rule. And you got to take a visual related to your topic. So basically, the visual story you come up in your mind with has to have three elements, pencil, snow, and topic. For 12, you do the same thing, but you're gonna use a swan, because 12 has a two in it. Now I know we used, for number two, to remember survival, we had a certain image, right? A swan struggling for survival. We're still gonna use a swan here, but it's gonna be involved with snow, and it's gonna be involved with some visual related to our topic. What are the topics? Music is 11, 12 is exploration. So let's start with music. We got to use a pencil, we got to use snow, and we got to use music. So music reminds me of like a composer. I want you to picture a composer, and uh, you know the baton that they use to conduct the music? Instead of the baton, uh, it's a giant pencil. And imagine this conductor conducting music in like blizzard-like conditions. Maybe there's an orchestra in front of him, and he's conducting the music in a blizzard. Doesn't make any sense, but that's okay. We go with it because that's how our memory works. We'll remember something better if we come up with a strange image. So that's how we're gonna remember music. The conductor with the pencil conducting music. 12, we gotta use a swan, right? We gotta use snow. And we gotta use something related to exploration. So you can type in the comments or in the live chat, what do you think of when you think of exploration? For me, it's space exploration. So I think of space. For you, it might be something else. It could be, uh, I don't know, exploring the ocean. It could be exploring a jungle, or it could be like travel. Travel, when I think of travel, it's a form of exploration, right? Uh, I also, when I think of exploration, I also think of Indiana Jones. Exploration also reminds me of uh, Dora, the explorer. Uh, so we could use any of these images, but then we gotta combine that image with snow and swan. So I'm gonna go the space route. I want you to imagine for exploration, a giant swan-shaped spaceship, something like this. Try saying that three times fast. Swan-shaped spaceship, swan-shaped spaceship. It's very swan-shaped. Anyway, swan-shaped spaceship. And I need snow involved here, so let's just picture it's, a, it's snowing in outer space, okay? Again, I know it makes no sense, but just go with it. That's how I'll remember exploration. There's a giant swan spaceship and it's snowing, it's like blizzard-like conditions. That's how I'm gonna remember number 12 is exploration. Now, what if we did a quiz here? And you gotta remember one through 12. Actually, if you want to play along here, uh, and you got a sheet of paper nearby, or you could do use a digital notepad, uh, just put numbers one through 12 on the notepad, and I'm gonna quiz you, but I'm gonna quiz you out of order. So just write down the numbers, one through 12, okay? Write them down or type them out. By the way, for those of you that are joining us, you can type it in the chat, live chat or in the comments below. Uh, I'm gonna go one by one, or you can just type all 12 if you know them off the top of your head. But I'm gonna go out of order just to make it a little challenging for you. Let's start with number eight, number eight. If you could remember number eight, write that down. And if you think about it, or if you get lost, just think about what does the eight look like? Eight, of course, looks like a racetrack. Oh yeah, that reminds you of what? Stress. So number eight is stress. All right, let's try number three. Write down number three, if you could remember number three. Hmm. 
three looks like McDonald's, right? Do you remember what number three was? That's right. That's right. I see some comments coming in through the chat. By the way, we're live streaming on a few different platforms here. So I see some stuff coming on YouTube, some stuff coming in on our other platforms as well. So good. Very good. Okay. Uh, number three is, of course, wiring, right? So if you remember that one, awesome. How about, watch this. This is kind of cool with how this uh, system works. I don't have to give you the number. I could tell you the title of the chapter, and you're going to know exactly what number that chapter is hopefully. What chapter number is sensory integration? Sensory integration, what number is that? So you just got to think of the imagery for sensory integration. Give you a moment to think about that. And if you've located it, by the way, if you're watching the recording, you just pause this and or even the live, you can pause before I say the answer. Nine, of course, is sensory integration. How about where does short-term memory go? Oh, yeah, you're probably thinking about those short pirates, right? Five is a hook, right? So that reminds me of the pirates. Five is where short-term memory goes. How about number two? Number two is the swan. Oh, yeah, that probably reminds you of the swan that was drowning, struggling for survival. If you got it, very good. How about number 11? Now, remember, snow is involved. And a pencil is involved. 11, of course, is music right remember the conductor with the pencil in the blizzard how about number one pencil again but the first one we did was what probably remember exercise right people working out with pencils how about number six write down number six the cherry all right if you got that one very good cherry reminds you of long-term memory Hopefully. How about number 10? Number 10. 10 is our plate or bowl, right? The play setting. Oh, yeah, the bowl or plate filled with eyeballs. Vision is number 10. How about number 12? We only got a few more here. Remember, snow is involved and a swan is involved. The 12 has a two in it. So that's why we're using swan and snow. Snow is the rule, swan is in the 12. Hmm. Oh, yeah, the swan shaped spaceship. Uh, going through blizzard-like conditions in outer space. That's all related to exploration. Okay, and write down number four. If you can remember four, our chair. Four is the chair. Oh yeah, the chair with the creepy hands that help you pay attention. And the last one is number seven. If you can remember number seven, write it down or type it out or just think about it. Seven is the lightning bolt. Oh yeah, getting hit by lightning when we hit snooze. That's related to sleep. So you see how the system would work. And if you got all 12 of them, great. Even if you missed one, not the end of the world. You know what's great about our brain? When we make mistakes, our brain usually tries to self-correct. So even if you got 11 out of 12 or 10 out of 12, the ones you got wrong, well, next time, if you had to quiz yourself, you wouldn't get them wrong. Or if you really had to remember this for a test tomorrow, review your images again. And also be aware that the exercise we just did, I gave you my images that's actually a little bit more challenging than if you made your own images because you're more likely to remember your images as opposed to mine so if you got all 12 great but i just wanted to bring this system up because this is a way it's kind of like a memory trick or a technique that you can use or a strategy however you want to think of it for memorizing information and here's the cool thing. If you got to remember more than 20 things or more than 30 things, you just make new rules. So 11 through 20, your rule might be snow. 21 through 30, you could use whatever rule you want. The rule that I use for 21 through 30 is there has to be a fight going on. And that leads to all sorts of weird images. 31 through 40, make another rule. I hope you never have to remember 47 things in a precise order. But if you did, at least you have a system. Most people, when they're trying to memorize, they don't have a system. And this is one system. There are others, but I like teaching this one because it's easy to pick up quickly and implement right away. There's another system. Let me, let me tell you about it real quick. Um, and this is going to be the last system we cover today. The memory palace technique. This was used by the ancient Greeks. It's also known as the method of loci. Now, how does this work? You take a location you're familiar with, like your home, 
and you basically do a walkthrough of your home. Now, let me explain what I mean by this walkthrough here. When you come home from uh, work or school, what is location number one? Maybe it's your front door. Maybe it's, uh, I don't know, it doesn't have to be front door. It could be uh, the parking lot or the parking garage or your driveway. Number one could be your mailbox, whatever you want. But then you go to location number two. What's after that? Could be your closet where you hang your jacket or put your shoes. Uh, what's after that? It could be the hallway leading to the kitchen and so on. So you make a walkthrough. And I've got 10 locations here. You could have more than 10, obviously. But here's another approach you can take because what we're going to do is use locations and associate to things we need to remember. But you don't have to do this approach. Another approach is to think of it from the standpoint of, you know, when you wake up, where are you? Bedroom, right? Not necessarily, but assuming most of the time you're waking up in your bedroom. Number two could be closet where you go to get your clothes to get ready for work or school. Uh, number three might be the bathroom and then the hallway leading to the kitchen. Maybe we're making ourselves breakfast now. We're eating it in the dining room table. And then we're leaving the through the front door. And then maybe you're taking the car or bus or train, your commute, basically, uh, the first street that you encounter. And then maybe you continue your memory palace your locations from work or school. Again, you could have more than 10 here. Why do we do this? We want to associate to things we got to remember. So for example, let's say you got to remember something in the technology area. Uh, you're going to use your memory palace as your home. They call it a memory palace. It's just a location that you are going to use to remember things. Let's say these are the first five locations, mailbox, front door, stairway, living room, hallway, and the next one might be kitchen. And then and we keep going. Let's say these are the first five locations and the first five things you got to remember. Okay. Maybe, I don't know, maybe it's a list of the top 10 largest tech companies in the US. Now, this is not the top 10. I just made up this list. Although I think Apple is number one in terms of market capitalization. If this was the list, you just need an image for Apple. What is that image? I don't know. Maybe it's a bunch of apples or iPhones or whatever you want. But you got to associate the image you come up with Apple with the mailbox. And again, try to exaggerate. So I don't know about you, but Apple reminds me of uh, the founder of or co-founder of Apple, Steve Jobs. I would admit, and he, he died, he passed away a few years ago. Uh, I would picture the ghost of Steve Jobs coming out of my mailbox as I open it. Kind of like a you know, like a genie out of a bottle. <laughs> okay, maybe he grants me three wishes. Uh, that's all I'll remember. Apple is number one, mailbox. Amazon, if that's number two, I got to associate Amazon with uh, the front door. Maybe a giant box from Amazon, or maybe I picture Jeff Bezos, the you know founder of Amazon, and uh, maybe he's at my front door delivering a box to me from Amazon. That would be very weird. For Facebook, I might picture Mark Zuckerberg and I associate it to the stairway. Maybe I go into my home and I see that Mark Zuckerberg is sitting on my stairway. And I'd be like, Mark Zuckerberg, why have you violated my privacy yet again by breaking into my home? So again, get the more riled up you get, the better. Twitter, bluebirds flying around the living room. I think you get the idea. But the cool thing about this technique is it allows you to also memorize details. What if you got to remember three details about Twitter, five details about Facebook, these seven really important things about Amazon? You can use this technique to do it. Here's how. All three details need to be visualized, and you put them in three areas of the location. The living room, okay, what are three areas of the living room? Like three objects. Maybe we use the couch, the coffee table, and the TV. If you had to remember more than three details, I'm sure you have other areas of the living room you could use. You could use the windows, the wall, the ceiling, the rug, the lamp, anything you want. And if you need order, just go clockwise around the room looking around. That's how we can visually remember things better. And the other cool thing about this memory palace technique that makes it so effective is that you could use multiple memory palaces. Your home is not the only location you're familiar with. What about where you went to school or where you're currently going to school? What about where you work, your office space? What about uh, your friend's place, grandma's place, your childhood home? You could use all these locations and that comes in handy when you got finals coming around. If you have finals coming around, 
and you got to remember a bunch of things for a variety of classes. You might use your house to remember things for your uh, anatomy class. You might use uh, your workplace for remembering your history class and so on and so forth. So this is a very effective technique. It's a few thousand years old, but gold. So utilize a memory palace next time you got to memorize something. And that's all part of this storage step over here. And by the way, if you are interested in diving deeper into memory or speed reading or note taking, we have advanced courses on all of this. If you go to the link you see on your screen, which is basically just irisreading.com slash courses. I'm just going to type that in the chat so you can see. If you go to that link, it'll take you to basically our advanced courses that go into a lot more detail on speed reading, memorization, comprehension. Also, if you are interested in learning different methods of note taking that are unique and effective, you can check out our note taking class. There's also a class on personal productivity. So check that out. If you want to get a discount, use this particular code. And it's just my name, Paul. And that'll give you an extra 30% off any kind of discount we have on the site. So if you want to dive deeper, if you like these topics of memory, all the courses are taught by me. If you like these topics on memory and other topics to make you a, a better student or just a more productive uh, person in the workplace, check out some of these courses. We've done them for uh, employees at NASA, Google, LinkedIn. We've done this for the Army, the Navy, intelligence agencies. And I think you'll find them very helpful. Also, if you want more content from the YouTube channel, if you like what we're doing, the streaming that we're doing is just kind of experimental. We wanted to see how much interest there might be here. We might do some more live streams. Feel free to subscribe, but we're also going to be posting videos. So if you're interested in any of these topics on productivity, study skills, literacy, memorization, subscribe to the channel. We're going to be posting more content. And here's my contact information if you want to keep in touch or if you want to connect on LinkedIn. Uh, or Instagram. Here are the links where you can find me. I want to thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to check this video out. I hope you found it helpful. Feel free to keep in touch. If you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, just shoot me a message with your connection request saying that you attended the session. And uh, that way I, because I get a lot of connection requests for usually people that are just trying to sell me things. <laughs> um, so I'd appreciate if you let me know that you attended. That way I'd rather connect with people that attended the sessions than just uh, random people trying to spam me things. A lot of these LinkedIn, uh, I'm starting to think that some of these LinkedIn uh, connection requests might not even be from real people. They might just be robots nowadays. But let me know if you attended. I hope you found the session helpful. And again, don't forget to subscribe to the channel down below. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day. Hope you found this helpful and have a great rest of the week. Take care.